Hello, and welcome to this tutorial on programming text adventures. I've been working on a big game project for a couple of years now, but wanting to work on some smaller things. Uh, I recently returned to my roots and started writing a new text adventure game. When someone said they, they too wanted to make a text adventure, but thought the programming would be a lot of work, I was inspired to make this tutorial video. I'll be using QB64 for this, which comes from the basic family of languages, but you don't need very much coding knowledge to do this, and you can easily take the concepts into any language, even one you don't know yet. You need to know how to use variables and arrays, put text on the screen, get input from the player, process text strings in a few simple ways, and use conditionals like if then or select case. Okay, so the first thing to talk about is this wall of constants in the header. I'm using these to give myself a layer of abstraction away from using actual numbers in the code. This way, instead of asking whether an item state is 0 or 1, I can ask whether the state is no item, have item, or used item. I can also ask about an item called flashlight instead of asking about item number 2. And then when I look at the code later, I won't have to go check what item number 2 is. The code itself will tell me I'm looking at the flashlight item. And since doors are a really common thing in a game like this too, I also have a set of constants for open and closed doors. This makes the code much easier to read. And there's another big advantage here too. As I add more stuff, I can move these numbers around however I please, and I don't have to adjust anything else. The code doesn't care which values the constants have, only that they all have unique values. Notice the stuff at the start of the constants here. I, S, H, G, T, H. These are prefixes to tell me what kind of constant I'm looking at, and it also prevents these constants from conflicting with other variables I might use. So I means it's about an item, and uh, TH means it's something that's found in the theater. And after these item constants, you can see a bunch of constants starting with F. So these are non-item constants, stuff like doors being open or closed, elevators up or down, lights on or off, stuff like that. All of the flags are stored in this flag array. So you use the constant in the parentheses, and then the value is the state of the flag. <clears throat> I'm keeping the items together at the top here so when the player wants to check inventory, I can count through the item flags from one up to the total items constant. This also means that if I change the item constant numbers, I'll change the order they appear in the inventory. And I don't need to make sure the numbers are consecutive because the game will skip over any numbers that don't exist. Each item has an item name string right here. This is what the player will see in the inventory, these strings. With these flags, these constants and the flags, <coughs> the flag array, we can describe the entire game state, except for one thing, where the player is standing. And that's what all these location constants are for. They all start with L for location. And whenever you go to a new location in the game, um, the game will put the put your location in the lo put the location constant that you're at in the location variable. So it sets that. Um, okay, so here's where the main game loop starts, right here, this do, and it goes all the way down, almost to the bottom. Here's where it ends, the end select will come up in a second here. <clears throat> so at the start of the main game loop here, this is where we get input from the player, this one input statement. Before that, we'll talk about this thing in a minute. Um, so then after we get input, we process the input so it's easier for us to use. So we make sure it's all lowercase and so nothing is case sensitive. It doesn't make sense for stuff to be case sensitive in a text adventure. Then uh, remove everything that isn't a letter, number, or space. Then remove any spaces at the start and then dump the first word in the verb string. Then remove leading spaces again and dump the second word into the object string. And then we've got two, two strings here, we've got two words, a verb and an object. 
And we've also got a neat little trick here. And the, uh, um, if the player types nothing, then it skips over all this input processing and it just keeps the last verb and object from the previous, previous input loop, which means the player can, can, can repeat any commands they use by hitting enter without typing anything. It'll just use whatever they type last. And the game will just ignore anything after the second word. This, in, this input processing is really simple. You could upgrade it to be more sophisticated and flexi flexible if you like, and like analyze the grammar, but this will work just fine if you use it correctly. This simple two word system can make sure the player won't be overwhelmed by too many options, as long as you effectively communicate how it works, what the player's limitations are. So once we have the verb and the object, we have a few more things to do. Uh, we'll convert some single letters into verbs, some shortcuts here, so the player can spend less time typing the most common things. This way you can walk north by typing N, and you can open a door by typing O door. So this will cut down on the work the player has to do, all the typing. And now before we check where the player is, here's a bunch of global commands. These are things the player can type anywhere. So the help command is here. If you type help, you get this bo uh, block of text that gives you the most common commands should have that in any text adventure. You also can type your inventory here. Um, you can look at the objects in your inventory. Uh, saving and loading and quitting are, he are here. These are handled, saving and loading are handled very simply. The only thing that saving and loading does is save or load the player's location and the flag array. That's it. And then I don't even need to send the player anywhere. The conditional that we're using for all of this will just send them wherever they should be. So this is the only code needed to load and save. And then there's one more thing in the global commands uh, here because there is a flashlight and some batteries in this particular adventure. Here is uh, using putting the batteries into the flashlight. And because it's in the global, uh, the global command set, the game doesn't care where you do this. As long as you have the batteries and the empty flashlight, you can do this anywhere. And then um, the game will set both of your, both the batteries and the dead, the empty flashlight to used item. Um, used item means that um, the, the item isn't no item state, which means you can't go back and get it again from the environment, but it also isn't staying in your inventory. So that's like the item is out of scope. It's We're not using it anymore. Um, so for the flashlight with the batteries inside, I'm just making that a different item here. So you acquire that item. And now that we've gone over all that, let's go look at the first location in the game, the bedroom. So here's the select case location. And this, again, goes all the way down here. So all the locations in the game are represented by this. It stops right here. Let's see, where's the top again? OK. Locations are handled with this big select case block that checks the location variable. And I've got dividers between the locations for clarity here. And thanks to our location constants at the top of the location, I can already see what it is. You can see what that location is. And then in each location, there's a section for each verb that matters, with look always at the top, and then movement. Movement is always at the bottom. And then in the middle, we've got stuff like open, get, use, stuff that's interacting with the environment. <clears throat> um, the first thing here is look with no object. This is just taking in your surroundings. Every location has this basic description. That's how text adventures should work. But like many other things in this kind of game, it may need to change based on the flags. For example, if the lights can be on or off, you want the description to reflect that. And if it can tell you about an item you can pick up, you don't want it to keep telling you the item is there when it's not. These other verbs often need to check flags too. After all, for the, the north verb here, uh, you don't, you can't walk through a closed door. Or can you? Well, you can try. In this location, you can see that I do let the player try to walk through the first closed door as a joke 
that teaches the player how to open things. If you try, the game sets a flag that the door has been damaged, this bonk flag. Then when you go to open the door, right here, it has different text if the door has been damaged. Note how I'm using select case for verbs and objects and locations, and I'm using if then for flags. This makes it easier to tell which is which. Select case is also very sleek for the verbs and objects, since the verb and object variables only need to show up once. You see I'm doing all of this. Verb string is only mentioned right here, and then the rest of the block just depends on that string. Instead of typing if verb string equals this, else if verb string equals that, so select case is much better for that. Um, <clears throat> and now that you've seen some of the game code for a bit, you can probably see how helpful these constants are. I have a flag for called door bonk here, instead of a number that would tell me nothing. You may have noticed that most of the time, uh, to put text on the screen, I'm using this little routine called P instead of print. All this does is store the last line it printed to a variable. So way at the bottom here, here's the routine. All it does is print and then store in the last text string the last thing it put on the screen. And way up at the top, remember there was something before the input, player input, okay, right here. So here's the player input and above this, if the last thing it put on the, on the screen was empty, then I know that the player typed something invalid. They typed something that doesn't make sense to the game. So I want to tell the player it was bad input instead of just printing nothing. So here I've got, if you, this is just, I have this is incomplete, but if you type open and you didn't have anything with it, then it got these joke things here that I can type out on the screen that tells the player that it was a bad command. And this little function ran this just generates a random number between one and in this case three, whatever I put in the parentheses. So this is a very clean way to randomly select between a few things. Anyway, um, moving down to a dark room here. Let's see, where is it? Here we are. There's some extra text when you use the look command if you have the battery powered flashlight. You can only get this key ring or even look at it. So here's the key ring looking at the key ring and here's trying to get it. You can only get it or look at it or even notice it in the general area description if you have the powered flashlight. <clears throat> it's very important when coding locations to account for every situation that can occur there. And when you're designing the game, it's very helpful to design it so less things can happen, uh, to simplify things whenever possible. So later in this game that I'm making, uh, I'm designing an abandoned theater and the player can turn some lights on inside. But then the player could return outside the building, and I don't want the game to still describe all of the windows in the front of the building as dark. It's easy to overlook situations like that, but you really have to think of everything. Um, it can also be very important to make sure the player has all the necessary items before they go to a new location, especially if they can't get back. You don't want them to soft lock. So since you need the flashlight to get the keys here, for the car, later on when I'm designing the theater, which has a bunch of dark places, I don't need to check to see if the player has the flashlight anymore. If they were able to use the car to get to the theater, I know they must have had the flashlight to get the car keys. Okay, so going out to the path, you can see how easy it is to add more flavor text. Out here, the player can look at the general environment, the house, the crawl space under the house, the road, the gate next to the road, and a flyer stuck in the gate. And if I want, it would take seconds to add the ability to look at the nearby forest, the grass, the house roof, even the clouds. And the more you give the player to look at, the more filled in the world will feel. It's easy to add new locations too. At the very end of the location list here, I have a template that I can copy paste to add a location. This is all the basics for a new location. It's got the look command, it's got get, use, open, the most common commands I've been using, the directions you can go. It also has a text ruler here that's commented out in case I forget and leave it somewhere by mistake. I'm also, I'm using screen mode 12, which can fit 80 characters across. This ruler goes up to 80. 
This ruler makes it much easier to know when to add line breaks to my text. Now I could write a routine to do line breaks automatically, but I find the text is easier for the player to read. It makes more sense, it, the flow is better if I do the line breaks myself. I can add them in where I want them. Now keep in mind that this is a text adventure and you can picture the whole world in your head. See all the locations you're creating and you may even have detailed maps on paper with all kinds of notes about what does what. But the player can see nothing but the text and whatever notes or maps they make from the text. It's very easy to make things overwhelming. The player ought to be discovering little pieces of the world at a time and be prevented, pre be prevented from exploring more until they've solved something, even something easy like finding a key that's sitting out in the open. This allows the player to become familiar with your world a little bit at a time. So in the theater that I'm designing, I have the player given access to the hotel lobby, the box office, and the manager's office, but I don't let them go into the main theater auditorium and the backstage areas and stuff until they get a key from the manager's office. That way they've been around the whole lobby by then and gotten a little familiar with it before they wander in and get overwhelmed by the rest of the theater. <clears throat> and in the same way, puzzles can get complex and tricky as long as you make sure that the player has to play with a simpler version first and get used to thinking about that style of puzzle. So you can start with a little piece of the puzzle and give them something easy to solve and then make it a little more complex version of the same thing or reuse the same resources. And this also applies to new verbs, new language. Human language is way more complex than any visual game interface, but in text adventures, the player has to use language to play the game. So, unless we want to spend a lot of time making or importing a robust language parsing algorithm, we need to keep the player's possible inputs very simple. For the most part, stick to the same small set of verbs, whatever's in the help command, and list those verbs there in the help command so the player can refer to them whenever they need to. Let the player abbreviate some of them to cut down on, that also cuts down on typos. Uh, and then when you introduce a new verb, like climbing a ladder or pulling a lever, or even a whole new system, like having conversations with in-game characters, you need to set it up first. Tell the player the verb exists and make them do something simple with it. You can even check, use this check as a way to limit exploration, achieving two things at once. So in an early part of your area, you could have a lever hidden away to one side of the area that the player needs to encounter and learn to pull. And that opens up the rest of the area where there's some more complicated puzzle involving pulling things. <clears throat> a text adventure game works like a novel. It's the same basic rules. You are harnessing the player's imagination. Often things you don't describe will be filled in. They'll see different architecture, different trees, differently styled keys and doors than you imagine. They'll even imagine things you're not describing. So if they're standing in front of a shop and you only describe the shop, they may imagine the rest of the street and they could imagine a, a bustling strip mall or one shop in a wide open field. And while the meat of the gameplay is the puzzles, a rich but brief description of the environment provides a ton of inexpensive immersion. You don't have to spend hours modeling a steampunk airship in Blender down to the smallest details. You just have to describe the airship in a few sentences and the player will do the rest. All right, thanks for watching and enjoy writing your game.